the corner of your eye, huddled in the darkest shadows of imagination, it waits. Now is the time to face the fear. Welcome to Horror Lasagna. Embrace the trepidation. So, we're on episode seven. We're working our way through this next season. Uh, and this was an interesting one. because Europa Report. I knew nothing about this movie. I don't even know oh. if I had heard of it before. Awesome. Yeah. It's, um, it really does just barely border on, is this a horror movie? You could actually argue with me and, you know, convince me that it's not. And you froze. Hmm. Oh, nope. That wasn't you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Forgot the router or VPN? Nope. Nope. I just uh, blip in the um, um, Wi-Fi. So. Huh. Well, because you're like really clear now. You were really garbled yeah. before. So. Well, excellent. Okay. Well, I guess we're all better. So we'll just kind of edit that magic. There you uh, go. Uh, so uh, I had said it was ominous. You started to say... Well, that's crazy. That <laughs> it was crazy that you had that you haven't heard of it. Um, I, I guess maybe not, but it's um, you could actually argue with me whether or not this even classifies as a horror movie because it's right. I on am the so cusp. glad you. I'm so glad you say that because I did mention that that it comes. It looks like a sci-fi movie. Yes. Uh, it it appears to be completely sci-fi, but arguably it's not even sci-fi. Because sci-fi usually has some scientific elements. The closest we get to like some technical science stuff is the radiation levels and oxygen levels and how long they have. And even then, it's it doesn't sound completely accurate. Oh, you've got two hours. Well, she's got another 90 minutes in her reserve. Really? <laughs> that it's <is> not... <laughs> really ironic you mention that because one of the things this movie is known for is its accurate depiction of what space travel looks like. Really? Yes. Because they didn't mention hardly any sciencey stuff. No, but all the stuff that they do on the day to day and all of the just general genre living your life stuff that happens in that is incredibly accurate to what an actual space mission looks like. Oh, that's hilarious. So it doesn't feel like sci fi because it's actually more realistic. Correct. They don't throw <laughs> in any fancy, fluffy stuff. Um, they, they go through, in fact, it was nominated for three awards and won one. And the one award that it won was, uh, from like kind of a technical prowess kind of, wow. uh, site that gave it to them. So oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. So um, it, for, for me, it, it's, it was a, a very subtle horror. I mean, this yeah. is something you could watch. That's not super jump out scary with younger kids. Absolutely. Not that they'd really be interested, but it was kind of a, uh, a space found footage <laughs> type of movie. So that's really interesting. You mentioned that too, because that's another point. Um, the film is a United States film. It was made in the U S um, with an incredible international cast of people. Um, it was made in 2013 and people classify it as a sci-fi horror or a found footage film. And I don't consider it really found footage. Um, to me, this is a mockumentary. 
Uh, that was the other thing I put that it, it presents itself as real events in a documentary fashion, right? Uh, some hit some historical uh, event that happened. And we made a documentary to get the word out to everybody what you know about history, right? Because for me, found footage is like, you know, uh, Blair Witch or or uh, paranormal activity where you have stuff that's just streaming. There's no commentary involved. There's no background music. It's just, uh, you know, Cloverfield, uh, camera, I'm running, I'm running, jiggle, 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 you know. Um, this was very smooth. I'm. This felt like it was, I have archival shots of people in a lander right. and I'm going to put them together with a background track and the narrator who's going to tell the story. So that's that's one of my issues with calling it found footage. It, it borders on it. It has elements. I mean, if you like found footage, it's kind of like that because most of the the footage is supposedly from the cameras that are on the thing. Right. So you always have the same shots. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess you could say it's an it's a variation on found footage. Sure. Yeah. And it, and I, it is a lot like Cloverfield now that you mentioned that because you don't really see the creature, which not much, nice. just at the end. Yeah, and that, I love that. Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's really interesting to me in the way that it was presented. Just in that, it's that five minutes in the future thing. You, yes, you don't know when it is, but it's not so far ahead that they've got replicators and you know transporters and stuff like that. Right. But it's far enough ahead that, you know, we've we're going to launch six people to Jupiter, you know, so we're. And that's why I said it, it like it didn't feel sci fi -y like the Martian where they didn't you didn't hear a lot of this scientific babble and mar jumbo stuff because they didn't talk. It's just we're going. We did it, you know, yep. so uh, it, that makes it almost, uh, you know, you could classify it as a fantasy almost in some ways. Yeah, it's. Um... One of the biggest like technical issues for me um, as a guy working where I work <laughs> is that in in the film, uh, Dr. Unger says, you know, once they pass the moon, this was the furthest mankind had ever gone, which is, you know, true. If we were to launch a, a craft tomorrow to go to Europa, when it passes the moon, that's as far as mankind has ever gone. But if I was going to pick somewhere to be the first manned mission outside of Earth's external orbit, um, it would not be anywhere near Jupiter because Jupiter is a meat grinder between the massive gravitational Obviously. forces and and the uh, the radiation that comes off Jupiter is the largest non-solar thing in our solar system because it starts at Jupiter and it just spreads like clear out to Neptune. It it's just so volatile and so killer crushing. But from that fantasy uh, type of element, you, you can't do Mars because Mars isn't as interesting anymore. We've got too much Mars. And it's, you know, this, this it's is not dangerous. <laughs> right. I mean, if, if you're going to go to Mars and just touch down and grab some samples and come back, that's not really dangerous. It's expensive. It's going to take a long time. Yeah, there's the offhand chance that some weird thing's going to happen. Well, yeah, ask Mark Watney. He found out. But if you look at The Martian, right? With um... Mark Watney. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, born. Yeah. Jason born. <laughs> That's, while it was vaguely plausible, the things that he was doing there, to be wiped out by a storm on Mars is virtually impossible because the air pressure is so low that even the biggest massive storm that's going to come rolling through isn't going to blow anything anywhere. Well, but they are finding that there are uh, twisters and storms on there more than they thought. Uh, that's a new thing. The Rover trade. And, but, but the Martian is way more science fiction because he vested all of his information that's all real it, yeah. you know if this really happened this is really how you could fix it so it's very sci-fi yeah but not horror it's it's tense right and this this had some it almost it almost crossed over into tense more than horror for a yeah. lot of it yeah because you didn't know what was going on uh, the other movie that I kind of uh, identify with it is um, and it's gonna sound weird is uh, the descent. 
because uh, if, yeah. if you watch the descent the first half of it there's no monster sci or horror thing going on all of the horror is the situation they're in and then in the second half you have all of the crazy cave creatures that come and eat them this is the same way where you have this kind of underlying sense of dread just because of the situation they're in it has nothing to do with aliens or you know strange Yes. You know, beyond our perception kind of things that happens at the end. And, and really the, what I was thinking about is the horror aspect more. And what's the frightening part is the unknown right. being out in space where you can't just easily come back to earth or easily get repair parts or easily fix things uh, that the unknown, you know, beware monsters <laughs> be here, you know, yeah. the old map makers uh, that I think preys upon, you know, interferes of a lot of people and um i mentioned in here that because of its technical accuracy in in its depiction um people really nitpick the technical <laughs> aspects of it so wow, that's funny one of the things that people really didn't like is you get to this point in the movie where um james is gone now and everyone's standing there and someone says something about going back and, and like the argument is astronauts don't have that conversation because there is no going back. You can't just turn the ship around. This is a planned mission. You have to keep going forward and right. return when it's your time to return. If you turn around now, Earth's not going to be there when you, you know, where you should be meeting it. It's going to be somewhere else. They have the whole thing all planned out. You have to stick to the schedule. So right. that was, that's a true point. That was one of like that was one of the kind of critiques that you'd see on this is like, oh come on, the astronauts wouldn't sit there and wonder if they can go back. They know they can't. Well, okay, I get you, but it's one of those things that if you're in that industry, in that field, whatever yeah. the movie is and it happens to be, you're gonna find things wrong because things get changed to make the story interesting and fun for a movie. And that's across at sports, computers, space. It doesn't yep. matter. Yep. And that was the other point is a lot of the problems in this film come from the fact they can't communicate back home. And I can't tell you how many things I came across where they're like, well, if they have blah, blah, blah on board, they could easily send a signal back and blah, blah, blah. And then like these people are like listing the different kinds of equipment that they would have on board that could easily send a signal back and reestablish communications. And it's like, OK, I get your point. But Joe Schmo, who's watching this, doesn't know that. That's right. Uh, it doesn't and, want to. Doesn't right. Doesn't care. Right. I, I don't care if Maverick cannot do that Immelman turn at the speed he's going. It's exciting to watch. Right. <laughs> you know? Yes. That's exactly right. It would be like sitting around watching Top Gun with a bunch of actual pilots. <laughs> yeah. Well, my cousin is an actual Air Force pilot, so I never want to watch those movies with him. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. So the film uh, was written by a guy named Philip Gallat. Uh, he was born in Wisconsin. Um, he actually came from the comic book industry. Um, one of the titles that he has an ISBN number for is the Indiana Jones Adventures Volume 1. Wow. Okay. So uh, I figure you probably own that. I, yeah, I own the individual issues. And he was the guy who, who wrote Europa Report. So Nice. Wow. Okay. Um, he was also the primary writer uh, for the video game Rise of the Tomb Raider. Oh, okay. We got that too, of course. Um, he has, uh, he's written an animated feature called The Spine of Night, which I haven't seen, but he also was a writer, head writer in Love, Death, and Robots. Oh, okay. on Netflix. I, I recommend it yeah. to everybody. It's, a, it's an awesome little show. Yeah, yeah. Um, his film debut was The Bleeding House, which showed at the Tribeca Film Festival, and it was followed up by Europa Report. So that's the second film he made. Wow. Um, it was directed by Sebastian Cordero. Now, this is starting to get that international influence, even though it's an American film. Sebastian was born in, in Ecuador, and he became interested in making films at the age of nine, the first time that he saw Raiders of the Lost Ark. Which ties right back all together again. Right. <laughs> so uh, he went to Southern California to study film, and when he finished his education, he returned to Ecuador to start his career in making movies. He's only directed nine films and his first three um, debuted at major movie festivals. 
So he's a pretty gifted director. Europa Report was his fourth major length film and his first in English. And of the nine films he's made, he's won 11 awards for them. Wow. That's pretty prestigious. Yeah. And it, it was really well done as, you know, it didn't feel not, not that anything we've watched, I hated, but it didn't feel like a bunch of guys in Vermont, like the battery, uh, which was a great movie to watch, but it didn't have the polish, I guess you could say, you know? Right. And we'll come back to that in just a second, actually. Okay. Wow. Um, it's a small cast. There's 11 people who cast for this film. 11 people have speaking roles. 12, if you count, there's a little blip of Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. And that's like stock footage of him talking about Europa. So, but of those 11 people, it's a really diverse international cast. Um, Which makes sense. Yeah. And the other thing that I really enjoyed about this film is that almost everybody on cast, you don't know what they're from. You might think, I've seen this guy, but you're not yes. sure where. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the first one is uh, Charlto Copi, Copley. Sorry. Uh, he's from South Africa. He plays junior engineer James Corrigan. Um, he's been in 28 films from the likes of District 9, um, wow. which he won an award for him personally for his role in District 9. Um, he was in the 2010 remake of the A-Team. He was in the 2013 remake of Old Boy, which still I will not watch, but he was in it. Uh, he was also in Chappie. Makes sense. Another South African-based film. Yeah. Elysium, um, Maleficent, and that TV show The Powers. Oh, okay. I think that was actually on uh, PlayStation, hmm. I believe. I so, yeah, I mean... You have seen him around. You've never seen him looking like this, and you've never seen him sounding like. Th- I shouldn't say never. You've never seen him sounding like this. I don't. I never saw him in Maleficent. But almost every movie you see him in, I don't want to say they hire him because of a South African accent, but they're definitely using him for it. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So, um, I thought that was kind of interesting, and he does not have any hint of that accent in this film. Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> well, neither does Tom Holland in Spider Man. That's he's true. Pretty good about that. So, um, Christian Carmago, he's an American. Um, he plays Chief Science Officer Daniel Luxemburg. Um, he starred. Uh, he started in soap operas in Guiding Light. He had a role on wow. Guiding Light. Uh, he was also in The Hurt Locker, uh, Law and Order, Numbers. He was in the Twilight films. Uh, he's shown up on Dexter, The Good Wife, House of Cards, and Wormwood. Yeah, well, typical guy trying to get jobs. Yep. yep. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of TV stuff here and there. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Wu, uh, he played Commander William Zhu. He's American, but he works out of Hong Kong now. I mean, he was born in Berkeley, California, but he's an action star out of Hong Kong, really. Oh. Well, that um, makes sense because he had a pretty dramatic death scene. He did. In <laughs> fact, he, he had more stunt than anyone else in this yes. show. Uh, he's been in 78 films. A lot of them are Hong Kong action films. Um, so you're not going to know a bunch of those. Uh, but titles you might know, he was in Divergence, part of the Insurgent hmm. series. Um, he did voiceover work for Warcraft and Tomb Raider. So oh, okay. um, Michael Nyquist is Swedish, and he plays the chief engineer, Andre Block. <laughs> that was one of the other things that showed up a lot in complaints about this film, uh, was um, engineer Block and uh, the science officer, uh, Katya Petrovina. All of these people were jumping all over where they're supposed to be from and where their names actually came from. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Everyone really needs to take a step back. <laughs> that wouldn't be the Southern District where you said it'd be the Northern. Yeah. Right. Well, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Michael Nyquist, uh, he's been in 94 films going way back to 82. Uh, and the vast majority of them are Swedish films, which makes sense. Him being yeah. Swedish. He was in the vastly superior Swedish version of the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo movies, uh, which is where I know him from. 
He was also in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, and he was in uh, John Wick, just the first one, oh. which makes me think he's the Russian-sounding guy that John Wick goes after and kills at the end. <laughs> um, <clears throat> then you have uh, Carolina Windra, or Wydra. She's Polish. She plays uh, Marine Biology Science Officer Katya Petrovna. She's been in 25 movies, including a version of Law & Order, House, True Blood, um, the 2017 Twin Peaks remake, the 2017 MacGyver remake, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and she was in a movie called Incarnate. Um, mm. Incarnate is one of those movies, like you were talking about, where it wasn't even the direction, it was the scripting is what actually kind of ruined the film. It stars the guy who played Two-Face in the Batman movie. Okay, yeah, um, I forget his name. Yeah, and he's got this ability to like enter people's dreams or something, and he uses that to help exercise people who are possessed. The movie was okay, but like the day-to-day just conversation, like the scripting of that was horrible. Uh, Which, you know, is kudos to those actors who could actually pull that off. But it, it really drew away from the film. And it's one of those things, like you were saying, if you have a bad director on a film, it doesn't matter who you put in it. If they listen to the director, it's going to end up being kind of crappy. Yeah. Right. And she's the one I recognize the most in just about everything you listed. I, I've probably, I think I've seen. So oh, I, that's yeah. probably why. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anna Marie Marinka. She's Romanian and she plays pilot Rosa Dosk. She has 56 b- films under her belt. A lot of them are foreign, not necessarily Romanian. A couple of them are, but she did a lot of work with the BBC. She was in an episode of Doctor Who. She was in that um, movie Fury with um, oh, Brad Pitt. Brad the Pitt tanks. about the tanks. Yeah. She was in The Girl with All the Gifts, um, which is a good movie if you haven't seen that. She was in the 2017 Ghost in the Machine. So <clears throat> she's been. You know, around and stuff. M. Beth Davids. Um, she plays Dr. Unger, who's the CEO of Europa Enterprises and is basically the narrator of the film. Uh, she and Rosa take turns basically narrating in mm-hmm. kind of a um, interview kind of style. Right. And um, I did like to the well they're doing like the news scenes and stuff the documentary they had the scrolling news items on the bottom just like cnn or something yeah but i mean that really adds to the whole documentary right throughout the whole thing. um she was born in america but moved to south africa because <clears throat> that's where her parents were from <laughs> okay it's just we seem to have a lot of south african jumping around here <laughs> yeah it's really odd she's been in 46 titles and you're going to know some of these and the crazy thing is I can recognize her from the stuff, but I would have never recognized her from what she looked like in this movie. Oh, okay. She was in army of darkness. Really? Yeah. She was in Schindler's list. Um, Matilda Bridget Jones diary. 13 Ghosts, by far the least impressive thing on this list so far. (laughs) Um, She was in an episode or two of Scrubs, Californication. Um, She was in the American version of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Uh, She played Mary Parker in The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2. Okay. Um, she was in Mad Men and Ray Donovan and Grey's Anatomy. So she's been around in a lot of stuff too. But the way they had her hair and stuff, I did, did not recognize her in the slightest. Yeah, she almost looked familiar, but I thought, eh, I, I can't really think, you know, so. Yeah. Petrovna was the only one I definitely said, yeah, I've seen her in something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you've seen her in quite a bit, actually. Yeah, yeah. The movie opens with a shot. Uh, It's got the Europa mission patch. Patches are a really big thing in my industry. 
I, we're always making patches for stuff, and we're making stuff that's not for the patch. We make it look like a patch. I don't know why. Hey, when, I was, when I was in Scouts and we visited NASA Space Center, we got a patch. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, we got <laughs> patches. We got patches galore. So they've got their own patch, the Europa Mission patch. And the words, the Europe, Europa One Mission was the first attempt to send men and women into deep space shows up on that card. Right. And that's where it's like, oh, it doesn't say based on real events or something. It's, you know, it's a different way. It keeps the documentary feel right from the beginning. You'd be surprised how many people came into it with, was this based on a real story or did this actually happen? It's like. They should have done like, don't look up and said, this is based on real events that haven't happened yet. Yet, right. (laughs) Or they should have done the whole um, Blair Witch thing where before it came out, they ran it for about six months as like an actual thing. Yeah. They, oh, Blair Witch was crazy because they even had websites at the time that all linked together. Back I mean, when no one had websites. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was crazy because they really made it look like it was real. But that's yeah. a whole other discussion. <laughs> so it then cuts to an interior shot of inside one of the modules and um, someone's descending a ladder. I think it's Petrova, maybe. She's climbing down a ladder. And the following scene is of uh, Corrigan sending a message home to his family as he's sitting on his bunk in the habitat module. And then it cuts to a rear view showing a very small sun in the distance to let you know that, you know, they set the tone and location of the film just brilliantly in like three minutes. Like, yeah, here's a title card saying where they're going. Here's where the sun is. You can see how far they've gone. And you can see they're obviously in some small realistic spacecraft. And then and what they didn't do, which I thought was fine and great, was they didn't do the, you know, 18 months earlier, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Yes. Um, tonally, one of the things, like I said, the film's known for is the tight, relatively accurate depiction of space missions. And it's reflected in that in that first establishing, that little, you know, three-minute blip at the start. That page, that card comes back up and it says, for six months, the world watched every moment. And then there's lots of genre shots showing how, you know, everyone's sharing space and they're performing their tasks. Um, Talking about drinking urine. Well, that comes later, but yeah, I mean, yeah, all yeah. that kind of stuff that they do. Um, it, honestly, of all of the criticisms I have about the movie, that was one of the biggest uh, was during like that scene. Corrigan is just like super misogynistic, you know, like, Oh, the girls are complaining because they don't have enough shoes. And I'm like, bitch, these girls have more education than you do. Sit down. The one's a pilot. (laughs) You're the junior engineer, okay? But, you know, a little bad script writing on occasion, I I guess. You know, you got to let it. Well, it it could also be taken as just friendly kiddies. Also, we're stuck with each other for two years or whatever it is. You know? Um, that, so the genre shots continue showing everybody hanging out over time. The shots end up with this kind of jittery kind of staticky thing until eventually it, it freezes like our screens do quite frequently when we're doing this podcast. (laughs) Oh my God. We're being (laughs) invaded by aliens. Yes. That's Uh, what it means. Watch our podcast to see when it freezes on a shot of Rosa. And then, um, we get a shot of a solar storm. It's just interjected in there very briefly, but there's a shot of a coronal mass ejection. And then Dr. Unger comes in with her narration. She ta- starts talking about how it's, you know, it was such a great feat for us to do this. She speaks directly into the camera, interview style. And between these interactions and the interviews throughout the editing and the music and added in again, it just kind of reinforces to me that this isn't so much found footage as it's a mockumentary. This, yeah, it, it really it definitely is. This is something you're watching on the Discovery Channel, <clears throat> you know, based on something that happened. She's talking about the mission and she becomes visibly upset as she's talking. And then the card returns back and it says with thousands of hours of recently declassified footage, Europa Ventures can now complete their story. And so there's the found footage. It's you know recently yeah. declassified. But even at that, even with the found footage part, like you have 
Rosa, again, speaking into a camera directly, like an interview kind of process. Not the, ah, I'm running through a burnt down city, right. help me. And and the other thing is that you know something went wrong. And they really do approach this as if they really were making a documentary. Yep. And as if the people watching this documentary already know this mission didn't succeed, that things went wrong. Right. So they don't, they don't pander to the audience that you, you have to, yeah. you know, kind of go along and, and figure it out. And, and there's I, a lot of those little moments where they hint at stuff. So it builds that tension without giving it all away. Right. And I think that's one of the things that lends to its authenticity is that it feels like it does feel like you're watching something on CNN that you might have like read a passing article about in a newspaper. Right. Yep. Um, the first shot after that last title card plays right into what you're saying, because you now have five astronauts sitting around the habitation module, seemingly distraught. Well, if you count, there's originally six. All right. So <laughs> five of them there. Um, Corrigan seems to be missing. The guy who's calling home to his family and Andre's hand is bandaged. Then if you're actually paying attention to what they're saying, Katya is saying they need to tell his family, and now they're alone. Um, so they've kind of, in that little tiny window, Cortigan's died, and we don't have communication anymore. Right. So again, a very efficient way of passing the information on without having a whole lot of exposition to get you there. Yeah. Yeah, and that was done very well throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Um. Then and there was one little montage thing too. Also, I, I that they would do the the video feed montage of like nine. Yeah. And then they'd flip them. Wow. Okay. So they do the montage of like nine, and they'd flip you know different scenes or whatever. And then there was right at the end when before they cut that scene where one of them is someone screaming, and then it cuts, and you're yep. like, wait, where was that? Yep. Yeah. I was like, whoa. The ironic thing is the guy who's screaming isn't the one who's dying. But it still builds attention. It, it makes does you build attention. What's going yeah. on. Um, then they cut to an interview with Rosa. Um, she's talking about the, she's got this kind of disassociation that's associated not just with the trip and the length of time they've been in space. She doesn't feel like herself anymore, but also because of the trauma of James being gone. We still don't know what happened to him but we know he's gone and it's having a serious effect on the crew. Um, there's a few other scenes that establish that the crew's isolated from home base. So they're questioning what to do, decide, trying to decide whether they should go on or not. Again, you know, real astronauts know you don't have the choice. You're going anyway, but um, Katia is talking to Andre, um, trying to suss out how he's doing and reveals that he hasn't spoken to her in a week. Um, and the only time she actually gets him to speak to her is when she slips into their native language. Now I was going to say when she starts speaking Russian, but I don't want to say that because maybe it wasn't Russian for all I know. Yeah. He's Swedish. She's Polish or yeah. So, you know, who knows what language they're actually speaking to each other, but in the film, um, whatever happened to James really had something to do with him and it's really disturbing him. Then you have this time jump, and this is the part that can be confusing to me. And this is, this might sound, the first time I saw this, you have uh, Daniel and you have James. And they're both two dark-haired Caucasian guys wearing a blue suit. And it was hard to tell them apart, to be honest. One sat on the top bunk and talked to his family. One sat on the bottom bunk and then walked around fiddling with stuff. So between that and not paying attention to the timestamps, <laughs> it was hard to tell the first time I saw it where we were in time because they jump around a lot. That, that's interesting because there have been a couple other movies we've watched where I've been like, I lost track of who was who and where they were and what was going on, but I didn't have any trouble with this one. Yeah. This one flowed nice. So I guess, you know, maybe it's just the way people's brains work in the setting. It could be. Um, it, 
it worked out for me. I mean, granted, I've seen it like five times now, but it worked out fine for me this time. But you know, they established this kind of time jump, and um, it happens very briefly because Katya says it's been a year since we lost him. So we have, you know, right when he got lost, and then suddenly we jump to a year since we lost him. And then to make it just a little more confusing, the title card comes up. Congratulations, eight minutes into the movie, here's the name of what you're watching. (laughs) And lets the viewer know that now we're going to go back 19 months, 10 days, and 14 hours. And it, it, when you think about it, that's a crazy amount of time, you know, to, to be on this mission and, and they, they cut out all the stuff you didn't need. If you look at it like that, like if it was a real documentary. Yeah. Yeah. And if you actually track it, they land on Europa after 22 months, let's say they complete their mission and then turn around. They'll have been gone for just about four years. Yeah. Which is hefty <laughs> you know because he says when i get back my son will be six yep um wow, too bad oh well <laughs> it's immaterial for you buddy yeah hate to tell you this but yeah um so we're back to launch day and dr unger's press conference with the two actors who were in it so little i didn't bother looking up what they've been in <laughs> um and the scene does a really nice job. She actually goes through and inter- introduces every member of the crew. She tells you who they are, what their job is on the thing. There's a little tiny, like, interview snippet with them um, kind of thing. But with some really cool backgrounds video while they're talking. Yeah. And they're wheeling out in the monk and those bunny suits, wheeling out this big engine thing in the background. It's like, yeah, he's just sitting in a chair while they're doing this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, William and Rosa are doing the piloting. Uh, they're perpendicular to the rest of the crew during launch because once you're in zero G's, it doesn't matter what way is up. And that looked really cool, too. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was really odd to me was that once they cleared atmosphere on launch, Mission Control decides they're going to play Blue Danube. You know, it's kind of like, hey, here you go. But if you think about it, that move... With space, that song is most well known for 2001 A Space Odyssey. Right, yes. Which ends in disaster. Well, that, you know, maybe that's the little wink, wink, nudge, nudge from the director. Yeah. The other thing, and again, this is like a little thing, you know, it's, it's a nitpicky NASA thing, but like Andre says that he's spent more time in space than anyone else. You know, he's like proud of that. There is a cap to how much time they will let astronauts be in space. And once you reach those hours, you're not allowed to go back because of the cosmic radiation buildup in your body that we really don't have any kind of shielding for. We don't want the silver surfer on earth. So exactly. Can't go anymore. So, you know, him saying that is a little incongruous because he, they wouldn't have put him on this mission. Not for well, unless they said, well, pretty much you're not going to come back. So you might as well go. I guess we'll that's you. <laughs> one way to look at it. It's like all these people who are like, yeah, I'll go to Mars. And I'm like, okay, well, if you're going to go to live on Mars, you're never coming back. Right. Because the chances of you dying are astronomical. Again, if you're just landing and picking something up and going back, it's not a big deal. It's not till you move in that it becomes an issue. Look at Mark Watney again. Exactly. <laughs> Um, James does this kind of video tour. Uh, he's got his camera and he's like doing a video of the habitation module and stuff and up in the cockpit for his kids, which is super cool. And it's a really nice way of him to like orient the audience to here's our ship. This is how it works. We have gravity in here. And when we go up here, we don't. And isn't that cool? And so he goes through and like introduces cast members again and you can tell he's the junior engineer because when he like shows a shot of Andre, who was the chief engineer, Andre's like, would you put that down? Let's get some work done kind of thing. So um, I was... I, I, now, arguably, that's a pretty big camera. They got weight limits. Couldn't they have found a smaller little camera? <laughs> oh, 
Oh, trust me. There's a lot of stuff they brought with them that wouldn't have been there for <laughs> sure. The one has big ass headphones on and yeah. stuff. It's like, yeah, I don't see you taking that. Yeah. Based yeah. on what I know, which isn't, you know, obviously a lot. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Every single ounce counts. So Bluch. that sounds like a t-shirt. They should make t-shirts for the missions. <laughs> Europa report. Every single ounce counts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can think of some better ones like <laughs> If it's stuck, don't force it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's so catchy. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then there's a few more establishing shots showing how well the crew's getting along. It is kind of like a little family kind of thing. And then we move along time wise. It jumps back out to that six month mark, but it's not quite the six month mark where everyone's sad because James is gone because James is still here. So if you're watching, you're thinking to yourself, we're going to find out what happens to James. <clears throat> and um, I don't really know that you do right here. But they move back to six months out. Everything seems good. Unger's at a press conference. No, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, my notes jumped. Oh, it's kind of like the movie. Yeah, Exactly. And that was, you know, one of the other science fiction things that you didn't get in this one. People were getting nitpicky, but it's always, always mentioned and pointed out in these type of movies that as they get further away from Earth, the communications take longer. You know, it's always mentioned, it's always calculated, and that's going to be 8.39 minutes, you know? Yeah. And they, they didn't mention that. Again, that's why it didn't feel so science fiction-y to me. And maybe that's why people have to get so nitpicky is because they need to find something in there you know <laughs> well and they solved that though because at six months they lose communication altogether okay so the lag is no longer an issue because they can scream all they want if the signal's not being sent back no one's right. going to hear it well that's true so we go back to 19 months since the launch after this whole introductory thing james is already dead the male members of the crew are talking to Andre about his recovery and about what happened um, and his mental trauma. And he doesn't want to talk about it. I mean, he just basically turns around and climbs up the ladder and just leaves them there. Yeah. And here they make a very important decision because the plan was for them to get to Europa, have the, or have the Europa Voyager orbit, send a lander down to Europa to run three weeks of tests and then go back up. And Andre was going to be in the orbiter that whole time. And William, the, you know, he's the commander of the, of the trip. He's like, I don't feel good leaving him up there by himself for three weeks. So they decide to bring him with them. Plus they're down a man because James is gone. So they don't leave anyone in the orbiter, which I don't know that it would have changed the outcome of the film. Um, but it definitely would have been slightly different in that there would have been one guy left alive. Yeah. Well, that only, but in reality, would they really have changed it and not left anybody on station? It just seems to me like the, the backup you would need. And, and I know the, the mental stress he was under, but seriously, they, they, they go through how many tests and rigorous stuff. Yeah. So it's like, okay, suck it up, deal with it. We're on mission. You know, I, I just feel like that, but that's nitpicky and it didn't bother me for the movie. Yeah. And honestly, it's, it's a, it, it's a toss of the coin because you want to have an engineer with you down there in case things go sideways. And you'd like to have an engineer up in the orbiter in case things go sideways. <laughs> and they had two at the start of the movie. It just seems to me that it, 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 for three weeks with that thing floating around, if something would have hit it or it veered oh, yeah. off course a little bit, uh, you, they can't wait three weeks and then go, oh, crap, we, we don't know how to get back. Yeah, it, it, I don't there's know, nothing that part for us to dock to. <laughs> yeah, I've played that video game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so now we jump ahead again to 21 months out and they have arrived at Jupiter. And they're on their approach. Um and it moves fast here. Like there's some beautiful shots of Jupiter as they're approaching. They leave Jupiter's. Well, you never really leave Jupiter's orbit. 
but they leave Jupiter's orbit and start orbiting Europa, and the lander starts coming down. As they're coming down in the landing zone, there's some thermal venting that happens that knocks them off course slightly, and they end up on the surface, but about 100 meters off from the landing zone. Which is and I love thought. the... Well, it doesn't seem like it does, but it seems like it's a big deal to them. Yeah. <laughs> but I love the scientist, too. He's like, hey, you know what? Even if we don't find anything, that's a discovery. I mean, that's true scientist yep. thinking. Yep. And he's like, here's like, well, you know, we'll see what we do find. At least it'll be something. And I think that was... That was really interesting because Williams, the commander of the mission, and his whole thing is to get the mission there and get it done right and then get out. And he's the one who's saying, if we don't find anything, that's still a discovery. And then you have Katya, who is a marine biologist, and she's like, yeah, but really, come on. We can look a little more, can't we? Just a little bit more? Um, Which I don't know if... A marine biologist would have been the top priority type of scientist to send on the first mission. <laughs> but, you know, that's that's maybe just me. Well, no, that's I, not how I would have outfitted my party in the, the pub. <laughs> well, so if you're outfitting in the pub, in the pub, you have two pilots, two engineers and two scientists. So she was the marine biologist. But Daniel's actually the head, the chief scientist, science officer who's there. We don't really know what his specific background specialty is but i mean and neil degrasse tyson's whole little thing is you know i want to cut a hole in the ice and go fishing and see what licks you know licks the end of my camera which was kind of funny yeah um that is like part of the big part of the big thing people are excited to go to europa because that's a lot of ocean you can have stuff down there yeah yeah uh, absolutely yeah uh, it's all academic Yes. For us right now. That's true. Um, so they land. Uh, the biggest technical nitpicky thing that I've come across that I can actually get behind is they land, and I get it, saving budget and everything. The force of gravity on Europa is like point, what is it, point one three four of that of Earth. So they would still be almost floating as they're walking. Yeah, around I was the wondering cabin. about that. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 really, like you said, the, all the weird stuff going on. Jupiter, man, would be pulling so hard. I'm surprised they didn't have even worse problems. Jupiter pulls so hard. The four inner Jovian moons are tidally locked, and they're locked up so that every rotational sequence they go through, they will line up on occasions. And when you have three of them lined up in opposition with the other one, the gravitational force is so great, it actually squishes the other moon. So it becomes like football shaped. <laughs> and that's what causes like all these massive geological activity on these things. It's just the force of gravity crushing these moons over and over and over again. So, so what we're really saying here is if you do get a chance to go to Europa on a space mission, up your life insurance for your family. A lot. That's all we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, fine. They're walking around, normal Earth gravity, but whatever. Uh, they start to, they start drilling through the ice um, to get their probes in. As the sun goes down, and, you know, the sun's not really going down. It's They're ending up in the eclipse. But... As night sets in, there are quakes on the surface as the temperatures drop. Now, another one of the nitpicks is somewhere in there, someone says something about absolute zero, and the surface of Europa never gets to absolute zero. It, it hits you know, something like 75 to 150 degrees Kelvin. So it doesn't get that cold, but still, you know, it's okay. chilly. Okay, just the question for me is, did some of these people realize – that this is a fantasy horror type movie and not a real documentary. I Just say it. It's not real folks. <laughs> I'm thinking a lot of the people who are, you know, having these arguments were like people I work with who are like, Oh, Hey, there's like a realistic depiction depiction of a spaceship space mission. Let's watch it. And then they sat there and watched it. And they're like, Oh, come on. The gravity's nowhere near that. Strong, you know? <laughs> so you remember that day at work when like nothing seemed to get done. That must've been when that this must, movie came that's out. That's when this got released. That's right. <laughs> they all got on and started typing up. <laughs> I can't let that stand. <laughs> yes. 
Um, Andre is sitting in the habitation module. He's the only one in there. And he sees some lights outside. And he's like, whoa. And he tries to record it. No success. He tells the crew. And because of the state of his mind, where he's at, they kind of blow him off. Um, Katiana seems much more into the idea that he saw something. Well, of course. She's the marine biologist. She's the biologist, (laughs) yes. Um, And then... They use this this meme every time in a movie where they want some sort of monstery thing with external force. It glitches your cameras for some reason. You got to show it somehow. I guess. Uh, so you can see that the cameras all glitch at some point in time when he started to see these lights. So that kind of coincides with it. They call it radiation interference. I've never known of radiation to interfere with the you know frame rate of anything, but... Well, I mean, that, that they kind of show with the lights and the radiation. I took it as, uh, hey, audience, this is the hint when the monster shows up. And this monster is causing this, which means that's not good. But they don't show the monster. You know, we seem to like movies where they don't, like, show you the big rubber monster throughout right. the whole thing. Because it, it adds more tension. It does. Uh, it, it reminds me of the hacking scene um, from the movie earlier this season where all of a sudden there's a line of code that shows up on your screen. That doesn't actually happen when you get hacked, guys. Right. Um, But it's a good way to show the audience that it happened. I actually had a weird problem on my Linux laptop where I couldn't log in, and I know I sent my password, and I started trying other passwords, and it started, like, blinking and listing all the passwords I had typed. And I'm like, well, that's not good. I wiped the system. So, (laughs) But it was Linux. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, so Katiana seems more into the notion that he did see something. There's this very brief jump back to three days after the launch. And James and Andre are arguing over the possibility of life actually being there. They're making a bet on it. <clears throat> then it jumps right back to the present. And Andre is obsessing on what he saw. But he even has considered the possibility that he just might be crazy. Right. Daniel's like, you need to get some sleep. And he's like, no, I've got to be alert and awake for everything. (laughs) Which, if you're thinking you might be crazy, a little sleep goes a long way, my friend. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, again, this is where the movie, the real horror of the movie is our inner fears, the unknown. Because how many times do people, well, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye, but I'm going to dismiss it, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So the next day, day. The drill makes it through the ice. They send their probe down. Um, there's, It's, of course, beautiful and pristine as it would be. Um, <clears throat> then they hear this noise, kind of like a whale song. And someone even makes a joke about it being whale song. And then you can see the radiation levels are starting to rise. You get your camera glitch um, indicating that there's radiation that's affecting the cameras. But it's coming from below the ice. The ice should be shielding them from the rest. Then they see a light they can't identify, and they're about to grab some samples, and the probe goes dead. It's been hit by something. And and I love this. And there's other things, you know, with the whole dismissing it, blah, blah, blah. It's parallels to all the footage we have nowadays of paranormal stuff, that people dismiss it because, oh, it could be shadows, or oh, it could be this. And they, they do that in this. So it does make you question, well... Was it just radiation from the sun? Was it the heating and cooling of the ice? Was it, it, you know, any of it could be explainable. Uh, But you eliminate all that. It's like, there's a creature here that is hunting you, essentially. You know, but they dismiss it all. And it's very realistic in that sense. All you nitpickers. Yes. Um, Katia wants to walk out to the original landing zone and get samples there, which is what they wanted to do originally. Now we go back to six months after the launch. Um, James is sending message to his family, talking about how much he misses them. And it's really like getting on him. Um, and then you find out mission control lost communication with them because of a solar storm, which is, you know, it's a legitimate thing. It can actually happen. It didn't even have to hit their ship. It could, you know, big enough CME that hits the, our planet will fry communications, much less, you know, that little thing. It did drive me nuts a little bit that they added sound effects to the coronal mass ejection because no sound (laughs) in space. But, you know, okay, whatever. Every 
clip of film footage I've ever seen has had that. So it must exist, Reese. Come on. Okay. You guys must be lying about that. Um, Andre and James, you're going to go out, spacewalk, repair the damaged communication equipment. I mean, this kind of thing is they do this at the ISS all the time. You know, they're running out of time. Um, so they're going through panel by panel looking for stuff. They get to this end panel and open it up and there's a fried board. And of course, there's one bolt that just won't come out. If you've ever worked on a car, you, you can get three of the four bolts out, but that last one just won't freaking come out. Um, so Andre decides he's going to force it, and his glove catches something, and it rips his glove. Now, I question, if you want to be nitpicky, these guys are supposed to be highly trained. They know the the where they're at in the situation. I'm not sure he would just be like banging on it till it came free, you know? Well, the funny thing to me was that, and I, I get it from a character standpoint. The funny thing to me was that they chose the senior engineer to be the one who ends up like overreacting and becoming, yeah. you know, perilous because of it. That seems like something the junior engineer would do, you know, it's like, right. Oh no, we'll, we'll get this. And, but he was supposed to be Russian, right? So it kind of fits that stereotype, That's too, right. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so it rips his glove. He falls off off the side. He's harnessed to James. James grabs him and brings him back to the airlock. They're about to come in. And that's when they notice that James has hydrazine all over his suit. And hydrazine is, is a common propellant used in space missions. It's crazy poisonous. And if they get into the decompression chamber and pressurize the decompression chamber, then it's going to get into the air. It could very well kill everybody who's on board. And this was another little, little thing. They never really explained that in detail. You kind of figure it out as you're going through the scene, which I loved. I, I, I don't need hit yeah. over the head with all that, but most sci-fi you would be talking in like all these numbers and it'd be, it'd be this many minutes. And you, how much did you get on you? Uh, you know, 2.3 liters and you know, yeah. so, Spock uh, would be there calculating. Yeah. So again, th that took it out of the sci-fi realm for me, but I liked that they didn't feel the need to have to go into these hit you over the head details to explain it. More survivalist horror actually is what you've got yeah. here. Right. This is James yeah. Franco with his arm in a rock. Right. I, I think this is a lot more scary to me than like a desert island, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Never going to space. Right. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to put it on my calendar. <laughs> so Andre actually has a good idea. We're just going to take you out of your suit. <laughs> that is the part that actually made me get like, oh, dear God, I couldn't handle that. I mean, I was like feeling, you know, the, the butterflies just yeah. thinking about that. And you can do that. I mean, you the thing that's going to kill you fastest in space is you're going to asphyxiate. You're not going to freeze. You're not going to boil. Radiation's not in the pressure. Not immediately. Right. So, but you're, you're not going to have any air for like three minutes. It, well, if you go past three minutes, you're going to have some problems. So him getting him out and into the airlock is actually a really good solution. Unfortunately, he has no air because it's been leaking out of his suit and he passes out. Yeah. So James doesn't really have any other option. He pushes Andre into the airlock and closes the door and tells him to seal it, which they do. And then James just very lonely drifts off into space. Right. Which I, I wondered why he wasn't latched on to something at that point. Uh, you know, isn't that something else that they, te you know, the first thing they always do is. Oh, every, is you're always tethered. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he wasn't even tethered to the anything. So I questioned that, but. Hey, it made it very dramatic. Right. I mean, there's a lot of procedural things like there would have been a, everybody there would have had an EVA suit, right? Yeah. Somebody else could have thrown the suit on at the very moment that glove tore. Somebody should have done it, been in the airlock, been able to come out, executed yeah. the removal thing. Don't they always have someone waiting with a suit on? I, I thought that, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just saying from what I've read elsewhere. Right. But again, like you said, tension, it's a James dies. See you, James. Slowly. Yeah. Alone. You know, I mean, think about that, too. But when he starts floating away, he probably lost sight of the whole thing before he was gone. 20 you know, minutes. So you, yeah, 20 yeah, minutes. There's no, nothing around you by the time you're, you're almost, I mean, that's scary as hell. Yeah. <laughs> that's worse than the ocean. 
the odd thing, though, now that I think about it, he might never have lost sight of it. Really? He's traveling the same speed it is. And so well, he was moving away from it. He pushed off. He pushed off. So his vector would have moved him to the side. But it would have taken a very long time at that speed for. But he would have kept going in this direction with the yeah. ship. Because see, there's no wind resistance to slow him down. <laughs> that's a lot of math. That's just one more thing for the nitpickers to go after. So there you go. That's right. Um, we're back to the future now. Um, they're voting on whether or not uh, Katya gets to do the walk. And of course, you've got some people like uh, Andre's definitely against it, and William's definitely against it. On the other hand, Daniel's like, yeah. Katya's, yeah, so it comes down to Rosa to break the tie, and Rosa agrees. And Katya's excited, grabbing her gear. She heads out the door. Um, she's got her helmet on. There's a little rad meter on the hood in her helmet, so we'll know when the monster's close. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that thing seemed to be ticking up quite a lot. I mean, based on the amount of radiation that yeah. seemed to be showing to me, Kaya probably wouldn't have lived long afterwards anyway. Now, one of the things I love about this shot, though, is like the camera's in her helmet. Right. Really close to her. And as I'm watching it, I'm looking at her eyes. I'm like, her left eye is dilated and her right eye isn't. Yes. And that was, to me, another indicator of the monster. And that's what I took it as. The, the intense radiation blew her eye out. Well, it's and, actually... And Maybe hallucinating or something, too. I don't know. But. It's actually called coloboma, and it's a birth defect. Really? Yes. Well, uh, when, she's really like that? Yeah, when she was born uh, in utero, her left iris never fully formed. Well, that's crazy because it fits so well with this movie. Isn't up it close wild? Like that. I wonder if they did that on purpose then, knowing that. Put the camera on that side. I don't know. You know maybe, maybe they used it. Because I was like, oh, man. she Because she just... That scene, she just stood there staring and the radiation was clicking up there saying, come back. And she was losing oxygen slowly because, you know, that was fine. But I'm like, all this combining, you know, maybe the monster like the, with the radiation. I mean, it sounds Star Trek-y, but it like blew her eye out and it controlled her mind almost hypnotically and stuff. And that I just took it as an indicator. That's pretty cool, though. Yeah. She's grabbing samples out there. Geiger counters going higher and higher. Um, she makes the discovery of a unicellular organism while she's out there. Very excited. She's got 90 minutes of O2 left. And then she sees a light in the distance. And she's like, oh, I'm going to go check that out. And people are like, no, don't do that. <laughs> Which again, she's not thinking straight. I yeah. took it as, you know, the m monsters affecting her. There's a bio, there's a bluish glow under the ice. Um, and she's playing games with her own light. She's going to turn her lights off. She's going to turn her lights on. She thinks it's bioluminescent. And then the ice breaks under her and she's gone under the ice, right. under the water. And there's a shot of her face. Her eyes are just wide with shock. And then there's four of them. With, and the reflection of the light. Yeah. And that's the, the, you see the monster the most that way. Yeah. The crew is debating whether or not to leave now or try and get more data. They decide to leave at the next launch window, and the launch doesn't go smoothly. Equipment's malfunctioning left and right. They can't get a safe launch speed. The engine shut down. They're crashing down. They're going to crash on the surface of Europa. William unbuckles himself, and he blows the water shielding to help slow down their descent. And it so, does. Well, I saved you, but you'll just die anyway. <laughs> yes, it's true. He gets bounced around like a doll. He's dead camera goes black um water shielding uh water does a great job of blocking radiation and so they would put a coating of it in between the hull inner hull and the outer hull of the ship to help block radiation and in this case he blows it all out the bottom and it helps to helps slow their descent a bit uh, the ship is a shambles when the power does come back on rose is the first to wake up manages to get the lights on the sheep and then she goes down and she's waking Andre by smacking him in the face, which is the least safe way possible for someone who might have a neck injury. But, you know, in, in five minutes in this movie, it's not going to matter. They end up actually landing in the original landing zone. They're which I thought was great. Yeah. I thought that was... 
Uh, and it turns out it was a bad place to land. The ice is cracking under the weight of the ship. <laughs> they're losing oxygen. They're losing heat. Andre thinks he can still get them into orbit. Um, Daniel's like, no, we're done here. And it turns out one of the fuel lines froze, and that's what caused the problem. So Andre and Daniel are going to go out and unstick the fuel line while Rosa's in there firing the ship to, you know, get up there. See, they got that tape at Lowe's. You should have just wrapped it ahead of time. I mean, I, I know you've crawled under buildings to wrap That's true. lines in Heat the middle, middle of the winter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and now we find out that interview with Rosa was not an interview. It was her talking into a camera. This whole time I saw the interview, the first time I watched it, I thought, oh, well, at least one person survives. <laughs> nope, that's not it. No. Um, so as Daniel's leaving the ship, his Geiger counter is already way up high. The ladder broke off, but he manages to get to the ice. There's a shutter and a grind, and he's gone. Andre's telling uh, Rosa to turn on the exterior lights, but she's flicking the switch. Nothing's happening. He says the ice is cracked uh, beneath him. He's surrounded by lights. He's gone. <laughs> this is like on the movie Aliens when you tally who keeps dying, except yep. this one's a lot easier. <laughs> um, he was going out. Andre went out to turn off the life support because there's, he's admitted there's no way they can get off the, sh off the moon now. But he can turn off light support and use the parts to get the radio up and running, and they can transmit their feedback. And so that's what he was doing when all of a sudden all the lights and the interference, he does get the communications array up before he gets disappeared by a bunch of lights in the ice. Then the interference starts on the interior cameras with Rosa and water starts streaming into the living quarters. And she's watching as a mass of tentacles floods in. And then there's this flash of this creature. And then it cuts to Unger who wraps up Dr. Unger wraps up the whole mission. And that's the end of the film. And you do get the uh, one. Oh, I did recognize the one scientist guy on earth with the beard. Must I recognized him. Uh, from something I, I was gonna look him up but you, you get him going yeah well they all kind of died but wow we found out there's really life out there yeah <laughs> which is uh, that's you know what sci that's, that's a very, very sciencey science thing to do yeah we'll hey, remember you know, on day of remembrance at nasa yeah you know what that was the mission that was the risk nothing i can do about it but damn we've got life now <laughs> uh Two closing notes on this film in the novel 2010 Odyssey 2, C. Arthur Clarke uh, basically writes that a Chinese mission went to Europa and this is exactly what happened to them. So this was kind of like an adapted dramatization of this little snippet in Clarke's novel a sequel to 2001 a space odyssey oh that's cool i like that and the creature also now i you know this is kind of iffy but people have said the creature bears a close resemblance to the aliens in the space creature movie monsters from 2010 uh, i thought they looked like the things from the matrix well and i i don't know that it's not a one-for-one -one representation but it, cr monsters mentions a crashed probe from europa in it uh, Which is kind of cool. Maybe well, you know what all that means is that it's the government getting us ready to tell us that there really is these alien life forms and they're coming for us. That's, <laughs> that's what it means. That's what it was. Yeah. That so, is Europa Report. There's Europa. Or it's a movie or not. Yeah, arguably. Um, it's a slow burn. Uh, yep. It's not the high intense action uh, of some of the movies. Definitely so. not. It, but if you like space and you like horror, it's a good combo. You, you know, there's not a ton of those other than alien and stuff, but they're all about the same. It's all the dear God, we're going to die because we're in space and the aliens are getting us. Yep. Uh, and the visitation here is us visiting Europa and the alien visiting the landing craft <laughs> at the end. <laughs> Just coming in to see. Now, yeah. I, here is another question I had. Do we know pretty positively under Europa that it is H2O? It's not some other form of liquid something? We do think it's water, 
um, because of the way it looks. It, it vents uh, quite frequently from the pressure of getting crushed. So it'll come spraying out and they can actually okay. study the spray telescopically. Uh, okay. So I just, cause you know, if they do come to earth, then they can theoretically survive. Sure. If the, the closeness to the sun or the difference in pressures or whatever, don't just like the 2010 movie monsters. <laughs> well, I'll have to go watch that one now. Yeah. <laughs> so good. All right. Good movie, man. Our next one is much closer to home. Where we'll be watching the mouse takes the place mouse? on earth. No aliens. Definitely a horror film. Oh, okay. So, Something totally different. Yep. I don't know that one either. So awesome. Good. All right, man. Thanks. Yep. The creature slips from perception. Pay attention. It will rise again.